and their support have, have been able to bring themselves back to life and I'm afraid this is just not happening here. But is it fair or realistic to expect a single landowner to resolve a century's worth of decline? One of Christopher Moran's tenant farmers told me the answer is no. My experience is I've never had any problems with them at all. It's, it's inevitable what's happened is going to happen. It was going to happen anyway. It's a... Does the laird always get the blame? Basically, yes, I would say yes. Yes. The estate is littered with abandoned houses. What it needs are homes and people. Mr Moran's answer is a wind farm. The neighbours have already built one. He's spent years battling opposition to his plans. Now they've got the green light. The scheme should make him even richer. But it'll also provide enough cash to refurbish local houses and build new affordable homes. The reality for the community here is it's Mr Moran's vision or nothing. Is it right that someone with your financial backing can come to a community like this, buy the land and exert so much influence over the community? Well, you see, I would, I would put it back to you the other way around, that if you don't have landowners such as myself who are thinking about the regeneration, the sustainable regeneration, of these types of estate. Remember, this is 1,100 feet over sea level. The type of conditions that we ex have to experience in the winter are extreme. So the sort of investment that's necessary to bring about sustainable regeneration is substantial. If you end up splitting up estates like this, where is that type of investment going to come from? Where are the running losses of estates like this going to come from over many, many, many decades? It's time to head south again, but something's troubling me. The message I'm getting from landowners, large and small, is that owning land doesn't make you rich. In fact, operating an estate has sounded like a kind of public service provided by benefactors with deep pockets. But is that the whole story? We asked the leading rural estate agents, Knight Frank, to pull together some numbers for us, and they show investing in land is a very lucrative proposition indeed. Money invested in land performed four times better than the stock market over the last 10 years. That's almost as good as gold. And agricultural land, unlike most property, isn't itself taxed. Profits from any activity on the land are, and taxes are paid when land is sold or transferred. But exemptions mean taxes on sale or transfer often don't apply, which leads to some very odd quirks. Anders Holk Poulsen, a Danish multimillionaire, is now Scotland's second largest private landowner. He owns 160,000 acres. Danish nationals pay tax on all the land they own, regardless of where it is. That means Anders Holk Poulsen is paying a tax on his land and property in Scotland to the Danish government. Put another way, tax revenue raised here is paying for schools and hospitals in Denmark. What it does is it exposes the fact that we've never really properly thought about how we govern land, how land is owned, who owns it, how we should tax it. We've never thought about that in a coherent way. You know, land in Britain has predominantly been an issue about class politics, actually, um, and about the, the, you know, the haves and the have-nots. Um, you know, Britain is a country that's never really had a revolutionary moment, um, so we haven't done what the French did. Um, and, well, it makes me feel we're not living in a modern country. No one's expecting a revolution. But landowners are under growing pressure from MPs. They've launched an investigation into whether landowners pay enough tax and deserve the agricultural subsidies they receive. The man leading that investigation isn't known for pulling his punches. 
We want to clarify whether or not the amount of money that big landowners, rich landowners get is justified, whether or not they make a fair contribution by paying the, the um, complete amount of tax that they should, and see whether or not the balance is right. I think there's an extent to which the big landowners see themselves as being in Scotland, but not really of Scotland, I and mean, that they're above it all, that they don't really like the, the oiks or the rough coming along and asking questions. I mean, they're willing enough to take public money, but they're not really keen on having the public question the privileges and rights that they have. Landowners and farmers are no different to anyone else. They pay tax where tax is due in this country, but of course they have tax planning, much like you and I would do. Um, and that's normal and it's a good business practice. You're under intense scrutiny at the moment. The Parliamentary Select Committee are looking at this. You're going to lose this argument, aren't you? No, we're not. No, and you know I'm all in favour of scrutiny because we've got a good and very positive story to tell, so bring it on. It was perhaps a little surprising to hear Doug being quite so relaxed about the possibility of wide-ranging changes to the tax system because if I was a big landowner, I'd know I have potentially a lot to lose. North, south, east, now west. There's one place I have to visit if I'm going to understand why this debate really matters. To hear how changes in land ownership can change the way people live their lives. That place is the Isle of Egg. It's almost 20 years now since the islanders made history and the headlines. In 1997, the island was owned by a German conceptual artist called Maruma. The islanders launched an appeal and bought him out. Today is a giant leap for Egg and its people, and hopefully another small step towards the future of land ownership in Scotland. Thank you. It was a huge step for a tiny community, and as it proved for the whole country. That, in part, led the Scottish Government to legislate, giving communities across Scotland the right to buy and creating a fund to help them. Sarah Bowden left the island when she was just a child, and now she's back. I came back four years ago, um, and prior to that I was a music journalist on The Observer newspaper in London. Um, and now I farm this side of the island uh, with my parents. We took over the tenancy of my uncle's farm. Her partner, Johnny, has come with her. Bizarre as it may seem, he's busy running his own record label from a caravan on egg. Johnny and Sarah are just two of the young people who the buyout has brought to egg. I came up here and fell in love with the, with the lady and, <laughs> and with the place, the island itself. It's going to be a Wendy house with a roof like that. <laughs> Next spring, they'll build a house here. It's the community buyout which has made that possible. The trust which owns the island is providing the land they'll need. That would never have happened under, <laughs> under a Laird, definitely. So what does the future hold? Will you be starting a family here? Uh, <laughs> well, actually, I'm already six months gone. <laughs> uh, ho hopefully, yeah. And the thing <clears throat> that's uh, there's much more younger people here that ha um, who have started families, and it means that your kid's not going to be going to school with one other person. <laughs> which, uh, so yeah, it's well, a definite hopefully. priority for us, of which I'm reminded most days. <laughs> yeah. So, big changes ahead for Johnny and Sarah, but life has also changed for the rest of the islanders. The buyout allowed them to build a renewable energy grid to power their homes. It doesn't generate millions of pounds in profits, but it does keep the lights on. Suddenly, you know, we've got 24-hour power, which is a huge amount of difference. Until they actually switched it on, they didn't know that it was going to work. <laughs> Literally, the electrical engineers are, mm, it might go, it, it might not. Anyway, it did. Uh, much to everybody's not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, 
this was the biggest project we tackled since the buyout. But fantastic, brilliant, the difference it's made to everybody. If you can imagine before, with a generator, you only used it for a few hours a day, really expensive, real hassle getting diesel here to the island. And suddenly, you know, we've got 24 hour power, which huge amount of difference. Could you have done this under another model of land ownership? I doubt it very much. That's all very well, but is egg really a template for other parts of Scotland? Is it a realistic alternative to large land holdings? There are those who would argue you're a bunch of old hippies doing this at the taxpayer's <laughs> expense. Are they wrong? <laughs> I mean, I might be one. <laughs> but there's a lot of people here who'd be very offended by that. <laughs> and we certainly don't... We don't use a lot of taxpayers' money, that's for sure. I mean, we bought egg. It, egg cost 1.5 million, and only 17,000 of that came from the public purse. The rest of it was by donations from the general public. There's a problem, though. Community buyout has largely run into the sand. A few highly motivated communities have done it, but is it really possible elsewhere? There's an estate on sale uh, in Angus, 5,000 acres, £29 million. Pounds. Uh, there's an estate in Argyll for sale, £11 million. Pounds. There's, a, there's a farm in Berwickshire for sale at £8.5 million. Pounds. The total fund in the Scottish Land Fund to buy land on behalf of communities is six for the whole of Scotland. So we've got to do something about land values to bring the value of land down to affordable prices, essentially to its economic value, strip out the whole of the speculative gain that people expect to make in the land market and return land to its economic value. And then you'll have all sorts of people, not just communities, I mean individuals. This is the big revolution, is to get many, many more individuals owning land. I set out to meet the men who own Scotland. That's what I've done, and they've told me they're doing a good job. Their message, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But no one's been able to explain to me how the system we've inherited is fair. <laughs> In just a few months' time, ministers will receive a report from a team of experts who are studying land reform. We're told to expect radical proposals Proposals which could change Scotland forever. I'm confident that the Land Reform Review Group will come forward with radical proposals. That's what we've charged them to do, and um, I'm keen to see, see what they come forward with in April. But certainly my party genuinely believes that, that there should be a fair distribution of land, that communities should have access to land for, to fulfil their aspirations, and that's something I think we're, we're, we're setting out a vision as to what we want to achieve. And if, in decades to come, we still have a pattern of land ownership across Scotland, certainly rural Scotland, where our landscape is dominated by big traditional sporting estates, will that be a failure of government? I think if we don't see a fair distribution of land, then, then with Parliament we will have failed the people of Scotland. Ministers are being cautious. The process towards land reform is at a very sensitive stage. But it would be a mistake to forget that within the SNP there is a deep-seated desire to see change. Change is coming. We just don't know what form that change will take and I'm not sure the government does either.